Good, or, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on this um, dry and sunny morning. I hope it is where you are. Um, this is number seven in the Scottish Business Cares SBC series of seminars. Um, SBC is a goodwill collective uh, formed in response um, by the business community uh, and Scottish government um, and led by the, the SBRC and the team there in response to the COVID-19 crisis that we're all uh, going through at this point. It's a partnership between SBRC, Scottish Government, and supported in kind by in-kind partners, Par Equity, Tarantata Tata, Tata Group, uh, Dorman Solutions, and Clark Communications. Uh, the focus of this newly formed service is to provide agile guidance and support around the practical legal and business issues being faced by all of us just now, regardless of your size and location globally. Um, it's really heartening to see that uh, the six previous uh, um, uh, webinars and, and this one also is bringing together uh, a community of experts to share their experiences free of charge uh, so we can help each other get through these really quite difficult times. Uh, this morning we're focusing on marketing, PR and communications. Um, we've got a, an all-star lineup from the Scottish community. Um, some of us are sporting uh, COVID haircuts uh, through choice and some of us not through choice, but that's just where we're at today. Uh, and the four panellists we've got and the topics they're going to cover uh, are Richard Simpson, Simpson from Tabern. Uh, he's going to be focusing and talking about brand and personality in digital and social age. Uh, Jennifer Miller from Calgary Communications. She's going to be talking about employer value proposition uh, and internal culture. Uh, Leslie Bryden from Clark Communications will be talking about external comms and uh, media approach and landscape. And Bruce Hunter from User Testing um, he'll be uh, talking about how you can test your message, customer experience and interaction uh, without going whole hog and, and getting an early uh, idea of how well you're communicating. Um, I'd also uh, like to introduce our host for today, Fred McCauley with three A's, uh, who's going to help us navigate today uh, and these difficult times with a good sense of humour and a different perspective perhaps on most businesses and, uh, and how we're navigating through uh, these next stages and, uh, and the, the, the environment that we're going through. And Fred will be talking himself also about his own brand as we go through it. Um, just as a brief introduction, Fred introduces himself as a stand-up comedian, but like most of us, he's been sitting down for about the last four weeks. Uh, he's appeared in some fantastic TV programmes, uh, some other ones that he'll talk about in depth. He's been around for quite a while and he's been a regular uh, in the Edinburgh Fringe in the Big Tent for quite a period of time. Um, his, voice, his voice is commonly heard uh, on radio and has been over the years. And uh, he, he gets the tech industry. He's been part of some of the, the, the tech award ceremonies that we've been involved in. And um, what, I've, what I've found with Fred is he's one of these personalities who does want to get involved and his participation here um, I think extends to that, that he's doing this for, well, I mean, we bought him a loaf of bread this morning so he can have some <laughs> toast, but he's gone and brought the toaster. Um, but it, it's, it's a tr true representation of how the community in Scotland is just that. It's a supportive community, and when asked, we pull together in really quite a, a, an impressive way. Um, he's, he is formally, for his sins, he's an accountant, but he was never a CA. I don't know if you failed the exam, Fred, but you can go into that one, dude. Um, and... Also, he's ongoing. He was the first Scot to ever uh, be the MC at the, the Comedy Club in London. And so there's a lot of firsts through the career and a lot of experience there. And like the rest of us, going through difficult and hard times, but wants to play his part and participate. So, Fred, over to you, perhaps. Thanks very much, Graham. Uh, yeah, it was a comedy store in London where I uh, cut my stand-up teeth. Um, and I'm delighted to say that in the last couple of decades that we've got... Um, Comedy clubs in Glasgow and Edinburgh, Aberdeen, even Inverness, uh, working regularly. But I'm um, speaking to you this morning from my home, um, south side of Glasgow. I'm in a wee village you might have heard of called Thornton Hall. There's a few footballers, uh, some well-known people. And until recently, Baroness Michelle Moan lived um, just a stone's throw from my house. And that's something I know is an absolute fact, because uh, it was me that was throwing the stones. Uh, she sold it recently and... Uh, didn't get as much as she'd wanted on account of all the broken roof tiles. But anyway, uh, I've lived in Glasgow or thereabouts for 35 plus years. Won't ever be able to fully consider myself 100% Glaswegian, uh, given that I've retained the ability to mind my own business. Something that Glaswegians singularly cannot do. 
and uh, my mornings these days well, they're a wee bit quieter than they have been. Usually I just answer the landline to people calling in to try and sell me stuff or to take part in a survey or something like that. And uh, I don't know if you've had this one or not, but I got a young guy uh, who correctly addressed me as Mr. Macaulay, uh, which I thought was a good start. And then he battered right in and said, so uh, how are you this morning, Fred? And I go, whoa, you don't call me by my first. I have no idea who you are or where you're from. Well, he said, sorry, I'm Jason. And I said, who are you calling from, Jason? He said, I'm calling from the Scottish Government Boiler Replacement Scheme. How are you? I said, I'm roasting and hung up. Now, I'm delighted that Jude and Graham and the others have asked me to join you this morning. I just want to give you a, a, a quick outline. I don't want to take up the, the speaker's time too much, but uh, just how important brand and image and the continuation of our businesses in comedy and the creative arts. And you may be thinking, is, is brand, is image important? Well, I'm going to name a few names uh, in the comedy business and just see if you can identify how important their image is. For example, if it was to say Jimmy Carr, you know Jimmy's going to be absolutely clean cut. He's going to have a three-piece suit on. Michael McIntyre, always got a dark suit on. Dara O'Brien is much the same. Even Frankie Boyle, you recognise Frankie has a particular style as well. And to that, they bring their, their brand of uh, comedy as well. Catherine Ryan, if I told you you were going to be watching a Catherine Ryan video on Netflix, um, Catherine would be elegantly dressed. And something that has been brought home to me over the years is just how important that side of things is uh, in, in stand-up comedy. And what are we doing? Well, it's pretty much shut down, certainly all the events that these guys know me from, the award ceremonies and after dinners, they're, they're gone for, I would imagine, at least five, maybe six months. Some people are planning gigs and events in mid to late September, whether they'll happen or not, I'm not sure. They're just in my diary as a, as a light pencil at the minute. And as far as the comedy clubs are concerned, well, just about everybody that's involved in comedy is doing something online. The stand has had phenomenal success um, doing a, a, a quasi live stand up show on a Saturday night. And uh, two Saturdays ago, at various points over the hour and a half, um, people coming in, dropping out, but over the piece, 70,000 people logged in. And that's the comedy club that can hold 150 in Edinburgh, a couple of hundred in Glasgow and 300 in Newcastle. So the, the goodwill is there. I think the goodwill is there. And how we, how we get the people back into the clubs after the emergency is over is the big question. I think and I hope, sincerely hope, that there is going to be an appetite for comedy uh, and without getting too serious about it, uh, any of you that are listening and you want to go out for a laugh sometime after this crisis, can't recommend stand up highly enough. So that's my wee piece. Uh, I'm looking forward to taking part in this. It's something out of the ordinary for me. For many years, I used to start my radio show at 10 o'clock in the morning. I don't do that anymore. Stopped doing the radio show on the 13th of March, 2015, because it was time for me to move on, apparently. <laughs> Good up. Well done, Fred. Thank you. I, I think that personal interaction that comedy brings, that feel-good factor that comedy um, should bring, uh, is something that um, maybe has uh, been a bit lacking because we're, we're, last, la we're missing that personal engagement. And I, I, I'm a great supporter of what Fred is saying there, that back to normal should be going out and enjoying good comedy yeah, and even good music, but and even bad music and bad comedy, just going out there and enjoying that atmosphere. You know, technology, as much as we've got... You know, we're all zooming to death currently, yeah. but it does remove that buzz. Uh, and there's nothing like a crowd buzz. And that's said like an Aberdeen fan, you know, 120 <laughs> people in a call, you know, and that's a home game. So now, we, can I just interject, Graham? You and I are the only ones that haven't got the angle just right. Uh, people that are watching are now looking at ceiling decorations. What, what are the light fittings right? Like, that's, that's the big question. Well, we, we, can't, we can't afford paintings in this house. So we've just gone with the, we've just gone with the light bulbs. Uh, as you can see, and, and, and wardrobes. So I, 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 I'm, you get to a certain age, you've got to get the angle right. You hide the chin or the hairline. That, both of those have gone Look from at that, Nick. <laughs> I didn't want to say. I, 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 I don't know why Steve Jobs wore a polo neck. <laughs> I think there was a lot of reasons Steve Jobs wore a polo neck, but that's a different webinar. So taking that brand and personality that we're talking about individually, um, I think it leads us nicely on, thanks for the segue, Fred, uh, to Richard uh, Simpson from Taborn. He's going to talk to us about brand and personality and that digital and social impact that it can have. Over to you, Richard. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. 
Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here this morning and uh, to get the opportunity to, uh, to chat to you all. Um, so for those of us that uh, work in the, um, uh, the, the digital and, and marketing industry, we know that uh, it's ultra fast paced. Uh, there's an obsession with always looking for the new, new thing as this uh, stat from Adobe's digital trends report uh, would suggest, and it, and it changes by the day. So at a, a time when um, we, uh, uh, when, when, when we're, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're struggling uh, with this huge shock, uh, there's great uncertainty, um, and, and where we have to dig deep to find our own resilience, I'm actually going to look back to ancient philosophy um, that will help us to ultimately look forward. Uh, to say that uh, trading conditions are tough at the moment would be an understatement, um, but we will get through this period, uh, and by being resilient or stoical, uh, we will create a platform for ourselves and our businesses to drive forward when, uh, when this is over. Uh, so don't worry, this isn't an ancient history lecture masquerading as a marketing presentation. This is uh, purely for a bit of context. Um, Stoicism was founded in third century BC by Zeno of Citium. Famous Stoics include uh, the playwright Seneca, uh, the philosopher Epictetus, and of course the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. Um, it's a term that, in my view, is, um, although widely under uh, or widely used, is, is probably not as understood as it could be. An official definition has it as a philosophy of personal ethics informed by its system of logic. However, I prefer to think of it as the ability to control emotions and, crucially, to endure patiently. So within Stoicism, at its very heart, there are... Uh, four virtues. Uh, they've been interpreted for modern times as being prudence or doing the right thing, uh, justice or morality, uh, which is acting with kindness, temperance or self-discipline, and then finally fortitude, which can be translated as courage. Each of the, um, the four virtues have a, a strong relevance to the kind of outlook and, uh, and mindset that we need to adopt for our businesses to endure the situation that we find ourselves in right now. Over the past month or so, COVID-19, uh, over the past month or so since COVID-19 took hold in the UK, uh, there are many brands that have displayed these virtues and a number of brands that, um, that uh, have, have sort of missed the mark a little bit as well. So rather than point out the failings of some, I wanted to focus on successful approaches that some brands have adopted to help them sustain their businesses during this pandemic. Errors of judgment will occur at this time, purely because of the, the desperation and the concern that many people have had. Um, but if those mistakes are rectified and apologies are made, then we should move on. Um, but as the Queen said during her very galvanizing address to the nation a few weeks ago, we want to be able to look back on how we responded to this crisis in a way that would make us proud. Uh, and because how we respond to it will have a defining outcome on our businesses for when we emerge from it. And I stress again, we will emerge from this. It's really just a question of when. I think a final point to make at this stage is that given the speed and severity of what has happened with COVID-19, many brands have had to act quickly. And often that means tactically, just to drive some short-term revenues or to cut costs and conserve cash. That's fine. Uh, it, it, it's a sort of needs must situation, but we should be thinking longer term too. And there are a number of brands that have used COVID-19 as an opportunity to reappraise our strategies or indeed for some of them to accelerate established ones. So what follows for me are, are examples of brands that have embraced stoic virtues in either a, a tactical manner or a, a strategic one. I should also add that some of the, the examples display more than just one of the virtues, thereby showing just how good these uh, individual initiatives are. So, so taking the, the, the sort of first virtue of, of doing the right thing, I think what Chipotle, uh, the US fast food chain has been up to is, is, is fascinating. They've been hosting virtual lunchtime hangouts on Zoom to help people uh, cope with social distancing and uh, the fact that they're having to stay in at home and not get out to, to restaurants and bars. Brands uh, teamed up with famous super fans of, uh, of the restaurants. And each hangout will feature celebrity appearances. They'll do Q and A's and they'll do specific content related to that hangout after each session. So every day, uh, Chipotle will 
post a link uh, to a virtual hangout session on its Twitter account, and up to 3,000 people can join the event at, uh, at any one time. From a, from a more strategic perspective, it's, it's pretty interesting what, uh, what Hasbro, uh, the uh, global play and entertainment brand, have, have been doing as millions of families worldwide adjust to having to, to stay at home and entertain the kids. Um, they have launched uh, Bring Home the Fun, which is a, a global initiative created to further the brand's purpose to make the world a better place for children and their families. Uh, the initiative will provide parents and caregivers uh, with a number of resources to help kids occupied and uh, engaged during extended time at home and, and indoors. So they have this platform, bringhomethefun.com, and uh, there's a whole heap of focused resources, including tips for family playtime, activity challenges to keep kids occupied, ideas for using games and, and toys to stimulate kids' brains, and suggestions how to cope with the, uh, the emotional stress that the situation can bring about as well. So again, the content features all their famous toy brands from Power Rangers to Play-Doh to My Little Pony and, and uh, Transformers. And while it's, um, uh, it's educational, the content they're producing, uh, the emphasis is very much on fun and, uh, and creativity. In terms of acting with kindness, I think from a, a tactical perspective, we're probably hugely aware that there, there are no shortages of examples of brands that have displayed generosity in some guise or other, such as providing free products and services to frontline workers or brands providing support for their customers in, in industries that have been badly affected by COVID-19. But for me, I think a great example is what EE has done uh, as, as a brand um, that they've been able to use excess capacity to give back to those that need by basically offering NHS workers unlimited data uh, for, for during the duration of, of, um, of this crisis. I think it's also important to say that they were very quick to launch the supporting campaign with frontman Kevin Bacon and again obviously he's, uh, he's there on his own. From a strategic perspective however I think COVID-19 is, is highlighting one of the most fundamental tensions that business leaders face. Do they pursue a purpose or profit? And um, from the example given by, uh, by Sainsbury's, I think they've very much chosen uh, purpose. They've reserved the first hour of every Monday and, and Wednesday and Friday for elderly and vulnerable customers and are giving priority access for online delivery slots too. Now, they're also limiting the number of high demand items that each customer can buy to prevent the panic buying and the empty shelves that have very much been a defining image of this crisis. And doing all this is fully in line with Sainsbury's vision, which involves putting our customers at the heart of everything we do. But for Sainsbury's, this sort of strategy is fully out of line with maximizing short-term profits. It's a listed stock after all, with an obligation to report its results on a quarterly basis. And so Sainsbury's motivation for this seems to be generally, uh, sorry, genuinely, altruistic um, but it may also be unexpectedly benefiting the brand because its employees are possibly more likely to be motivated knowing that their efforts are, are going towards those most in need. Uh, suppliers are perhaps more willing to forge longer term relationships with uh, a retailer that channels their products uh, to the best social use uh, and customers may be attracted to a store uh, which truly puts them at the heart of everything that they do. So they really do appear to be giving to gain. Thirdly, self-discipline. And um, Nike, uh, which is a brand very much built on mass participation events. I mean, this latest campaign for me uh, really advocates them promoting the, the need for social distancing at the expense of competing at sports and groups. Have you ever dreamed of playing for millions around the world? Now's your chance. Play inside. Play for the world. It's a fantastic campaign line. But from a strategic perspective, I think it's really interesting to look at Patagonia because for the past 45 years as a business, they've been at the, uh, the cutting edge of environmental activism. Uh, their sustainable supply chains um, and again, their advocacy for the correct use of public vans and, and, and outdoors. Its mission for a long time has been to build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Uh, in just the last few years alone, 
The company has expanded its uh, used clothing program, which is the Common Threads Initiative, which can be seen from this ad here, to renounce conspicuous consumption events like Black, Black Friday and encourage consumers to buy the sort of quality good uh, that lasts and to reuse, to repair and to uh, recycle them as, as necessary. Patagonia Apparel is renowned for its, uh, its quality uh, and its low environmental impact. And again, with COVID-19, uh, it's been very much an opportunity for them to accelerate their, their commitment to this cause. When the, when the crisis first broke for them, uh, all, uh, all employees were, were put first uh, and probably profits last because they, they promised to pay their employees while it closed all its stores and its offices. Perhaps after this period ends, we may reappraise our own view of fast fashion and buy the sort of clothing that is, um, is built to last. And then finally, um, courage. And I think a, a brand from a, from a tactical perspective that um, has shown a lot of courage in this, uh, in this crisis is, is Time Out. Clearly, it, clearly it's a, a media and content brand that um, has been built on uh, encouraging people to explore major cities and uh, for which the, the content of that is, has been adapted. Um, so not only have they temporarily changed the name to Time In, but they've completely overhauled their editorial uh, to focus on, on this sort of story. This is from uh, the, uh, the issue from the end of, the end of March. That was David Attenborough. And then finally, from a, from a strategic perspective, um, Dyson and, and, uh, and, and Covent, major brands such as Ford and um, Tesla and uh, I think General Motors as well, um, they are making the sort of scarce equipment that's required to fight uh, COVID-19. And um, Dyson alongside them has pledged to make 10,000 much needed ventilators and very quickly and at high volumes for, uh, the, uh, for the UK. They've also pledged to donate for the 5,000, I believe, for international use. And while they've received a grant, obviously, from the, uh, the UK government to deliver this, I think it's worth pointing out that the Dyson brand is built very much on its technical prowess and its uh, technical orientation. And so there is potentially significant reputational risk if the Covent doesn't, co doesn't go according to plan. I mean, in order to deliver these uh, ventilators at the sort of volume and speed that they need, they're going to have to completely overhaul their R&D process and fast track everything. So they will not be afforded the luxury of uh, multiple iterations, the, the sort of uh, time required or the time that they're used to, to produce their um, uh, vacuum cleaners and, and various other products. So I think it's worth pointing out just how, how brave and, and, and courageous a, a decision that is. So just to, just to wrap up, I mean, I think it's, it's worth saying, that obviously, tough times call for tough measures. Cash is very much a prisoner. Uh, we must have a, a vice-like grip on our costs, for sure. But we must also be tuned into revenue-growing opportunities. And this is exactly where marketing can help. When we come out of this, and as I've said multiple times already, we will come out of it, um, we must think about how we can put all that extra time and resource that we have into creating additional IP or some sort of competitive advantage for when we do emerge. And, um, and finally, I just want to leave us all with that thought about how we can apply these virtues to our brands so that our businesses have the ability to endure this crisis patiently. So um, we can all do the right thing. Uh, we can all act with kindness. Uh, we can all practice self-discipline and we can all be courageous. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. I mean, uh, a great set of values there that um, are, are being very much focused on just now. But uh, if we rewind a few a few months, probably should be demonstrated more of the time by more of us more often. Um, and that 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 you know, bring home the fun. I thought it was a Charlie Nicholas slogan from the late eighties when he worked <laughs> in an Arsenal. But I, I think there's that whole thing that there needs to be. There needs to be a bit of fun. There needs to be a bit of engagement that only people can bring in technology. Just as a facsimile of uh, as we go through it. Uh, Fred, maybe just a quickie from you before we move on to Jennifer, please. You Absolutely. Know, business community, yeah. business yep. community is coming together here just now. Um, how is how, how your community, I mean, comedians are notoriously fiercely competitive. Uh, how do you feel your, your market, your, your, your business sector is coming together? I know you've talked about virtual comedy clubs. Are you getting, are you getting environments like this amongst your muckers? You know, that's absolutely, although we are, um, 
you're hearing me okay, Graham, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, although we are competitive and, you know, we're very much standing on stage on our own, uh, you know, generally most of the time, uh, we are a community. And, you know, the, the big hit for us is that there's going to be no fringe in Edinburgh in August. Mm -hmm. And that is a chance when the comedians get together as a community. You see guys that you maybe are only seeing three, you know, once every three or four years. Um, and it's a good chance to get together, share ideas. And, you know, this, we share lines as well, you know. Um, somebody will have an idea for a, a bit, a, a routine, and your pals will chip in with extra lines that you can throw in. So that's something that we're missing this year. But it was, I, I like what Richard was saying there about, uh, you know, doing the right thing and what your response is. And from the world of comedy, I go back to Jimmy Carr, 2012, when Jimmy was in trouble with the HMRC and uh, allegedly had a, a meeting with his accountants. And he said, I guess we should talk about income tax. And his accountant said, Jimmy, if you don't pay this tax, there's not going to be any income. <laughs> Brutal truths. Yeah. And that's, that's where we need to be. Thank, thanks, thanks, Fred, and thank you, Richard. We're going to move on now to our second panellist, uh, Jennifer Miller from Calgary Communications. Uh, so, something that I'm uh, excited to hear about, that internal culture an employer value proposition is something we should really all be thinking about long and hard. We talk about culture sometimes in a very flippant way, but I'm looking forward from Jennifer's point of view, how we can enrich that and make it much more relevant. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much, Ria. Just bear with me two seconds and I will share my screen. There we go. So thank you everybody and I'm really excited to be part of Scottish Business Cares. It's a real privilege and joy to be on here this morning speaking to you all. So firstly, as you know, I'm Jennifer Miller. I am a director and co-owner of Calgary Communications. Now you'll see that I am not coming live, I'm not streaming live from my kitchen or my room this morning. Uh, and that is because I'm a mum of two as well. So I have to face real issues. One of which being is my 14 year old son, it's his birthday today, and he is an avid gamer. And being on this this morning, I didn't want him to be burning up all the bad with, with, bandwidth, sorry. So I've jumped into the office to conduct the presentation from here. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about employer branding and employee experience. So it may seem a little strange to some of you right now to be talking about employer branding and employee experience, but this is far from the case. And hopefully I'm going to demonstrate to you today why with live examples as we go through. But before we get into the detail, I want you to know that this is where your business can make a real impact right now. An impact to your clients and customers, an impact on future talent audiences, and an impact on your current colleague and talent population. Business brands, as we've already seen from Richard this morning, are all based around image and perception. It's why we make the choices that we do. We as humans are drawn to brands because of their values, their reputation, their product offering, their ethics, and the list goes on and on. And this is the same reason why we choose individual brands or organisations to harness a career with. So as you can see, the fundamental principles are the same. There is nothing worse than liking or aspiring to have a career with an organisation or brand that you feel aligned with. But when you join them, the promises that they made to you before you got there are not realised. Well, this is the very same during this crisis situation that we find ourselves in. If the organisation that you believe in is not acting or communicating to you and your fellow colleagues as they should, during challenging times. Your respect, engagement, and all overall feeling for them diminishes. And due to a plethora of communication channels available to everybody nowadays, everyone is an author. So the message gets out there that these things are not good. It gives people a stage to communicate their real life experiences, good and bad. And undoubtedly these communications can, ha can have an impact on your brand and your business. Outwardly, if you're a consumer and you've respected a brand or business and you hear negative comments about them, it tarnishes your view on them in the future, making it less likely for you to choose them in a B2C capacity or potentially as an employer of choice. 
So let's have a look at employer brand and look at the left hand side of the diagram here. And I'm going to highlight some real examples of what businesses and brands are doing well and who is doing it incredibly badly as well. So if we look at the EVP side, employee value proposition, proposition side, you'll see that I've listed McLaren and Sports Direct here. So let's just take a look at these ones. So starting with McLaren, and it, it does actually um, repeat some of what uh, Richard said. McLaren is a, a globally renowned business and brand. They're top of their game, well, mostly depending on who you support in the Formula One. Um, but if you go onto their career site, one of the opening pages sets out their vision and values. These are join a world-class team, enjoy meaningful and challenging work, collaborate with talented people, work at the forefront of innovation, and work in a unique and inspiring environment. This is their promise to you as a candidate and a potential employee. As we know, um, due to the pandemic, all sporting fixtures have been cancelled or postponed, and McLaren could have sat back, but they didn't. They used this time in a time of crisis to give back and to inspire their current colleague population by changing the game, using their skills, and by ultimately developing ventilators in a time of de desperate need, all for the good of the people and the good of the world. So you can see that their EVP stands strong, not only to their own talent community and population, but to the future talent that they want to attract. Their promise is definitely real. So then on the flip side, if we have a look at Sports Direct, they came under heavy fire from the media over the last couple of weeks for continuing to open their stores during the lockdown period, putting their staff under unnecessary risk, especially when they have such a successful online business. Their opening statement on their career sites, or as they like to call it, a job site, which I think is interesting in itself that it's not careers, is hashtag HD family. It was reported in a series of conference calls with shop managers that they were told to say to their workers that there are no more shifts available and that April was a grey area. They also communicated to thousands of sports direct staff in zero hours contracts. These are the ones that are only paid for the hours that they work. They'll only be paid in March, but won't be paid while their stores are closed. Quotes came flooding in from angry staff and upset staff about the lack of support, communication and compassion. One of these is, I've worked for half my life for this company and I feel angry and let down. It's a mess. So really the SD hashtag doesn't really work. SD family hashtag doesn't really work with staff up. As I think you'll agree that the way they've operated since the lockdown has been extremely questionable. It's a company that's reputation will have been damaged due to the actions taken and the lack of employee support at this critical time. So if we go back to that diagram, just as a refresher, and look at the employee experience side, I'm going to take two companies here. One is Britannia Hotels, Coil and Bridge, and the other one is M&S Food. So if we look at Britannia Hotels first, and when I tell you this story, it'd be no surprise to you that there is no vision, no promise, and no values listed on the Britannia Hotel's career site. So most of you tuning in will be aware of the Coil and Bridge Hotel in Aviemore. Well, this is part of the Britannia Hotel's group. This hotel is a popular destination for people with young families due to the excellent facilities that they offer. This example that I'm going to share is of extremely poor communication, impacting on employee engagement, and has been shared socially, impacting on brand reputation and future talent attraction. This was a letter that was issued to the staff at the hotel on the first day of lockdown. And I'm not quite sure how clearly you can read this, so I'm just going to read out some of the highlights or the lowlights from it. From the 19th of March, your, employee, your employment has been terminated and you're no longer required. If you've taken more holidays than you've currently built up, these will be deducted from your final salary. You're asked to vacate the hotel accommodation immediately, returning any hotel property. I think this is probably one of the starkest examples I've seen. It lacks any form of support, compassion, and is essentially making a number of their employees 
potentially homeless. Engagement levels for existing staff that must carry on with work must have hit rock bottom and the social backlash has made Britannia Hotel Group a, a, not a career choice for future aspirations. It also, in many cases, will deter families from returning to the resort, impacting on future bookings and business prosperity, just from the way that they've treated their staff. If we move on to Marks and Spencers, on the other hand, they've done a great job in communicating and supporting their staff. By creating essential food boxes and giving staff a 15% pay increase to thank them for their support at this time, this is for both store staff and distribution staff. Now, Marks and Spencer is in, a, is in a little bit of turmoil themselves, even before the crisis, with their, their, their home stores and their clothing lines being in jeopardy. They've tried to redeploy as many staff at this current time due to the busyness of their food stores into um, these roles, making it even more supportive and beneficial to serve the community. They also learned, a, sorry, launched a We're All In It Together campaign, which is an e-gift card initiative to help people to help others. I think Marks and Spencers can clearly be seen to doing, be doing it well. So on the back of this, what are the things you should not stop doing? This is not going to go, anyway, not going to go away anytime soon. Stopping everything you're doing will only be seen as you're putting back things when recovery happens. Uncertainty breeds distrust, so keep communicating, keep sending out your messages in as many formats through as many mediums as possible. This is essential for your employees, particularly if you have furloughed populations, and it also is really important for the attraction of potential future talent pools. So I'm just going to leave you with the six things that you should be doing now. You should go back and you check your vision, your values and your behaviours. These are who you are, what you say and what you want to be. They define your culture. Match what you're doing to these and check for consistency. Later others will help you to do this and if you need any support in this, Calgary are here to help too. Coordinate. Make sure that your consumer or B2B brand and your employer brand are in perfect alignment. It will be crucial for how words and actions are perceived in the coming months. Be open and be inspirational. Make sure everything you do and everything you say to your employees matches your values. As we've seen, what you write now is highly visible and is under close scrutiny. How you behave as a business tells everyone a lot about your leadership, about you as an employer and how you treat your employees. Get your employer brand out there if it's not already. There is no better time now than to state who you are and what you stand for in terms of values lived and employee experience. Social media channels are booming right now because everybody is looking for content to be consumed. With time on your hands, people are reading all sorts of content, so your audiences and your messaging is going out to a wider community. Tell authentic stories. Use the power of your employer brand to tell your story through the prism of your employees. You can do this in a number of ways, from simple posts on social to blogs to podcasts or videos on your website. Nothing is more powerful for the reader or viewer than to see your real values demonstrated in action. And get your candidate experience right. As we return to a different universe, the talent out there that you want is probably looking right now. So make sure that your career pages or your career site is up to date with your messaging, stating clearly what you're doing and the actions that you're going to take during this crisis and post-crisis. Set up a talent bank so when things change, it's easy for these people to be attracted to your brand. Go and do it now. It's the easiest setting up an email address. So thank you so much for having me on here. As I said, if you've got any questions or anything that you want to ask post my presentation, don't hesitate to get in touch. It's paramount as a business community that we all pull together during this pandemic and we're here to support one another. 
So my email address is there. You can link in with me and I'll be more than happy to help. So thank you for listening. Jennifer, thank you very much. I think that uh, that employer value proposition and that cultural thing internally um, is, is always challenging. Um, you, you get that high five environment or a mentality from the West Coast of the States and other parts, but you're right, it's a completely different universe. Fred, Fred what, did you, what did you take from that ter in terms of that? You know, you, you're a self-employed employer, so how do you pick yep. yourself up and how do you take from uh, what Jennifer's just spoken about? Do you know, that was a really interesting point that Jennifer made that just kind of echoed what I was uh, saying earlier on. Uh, I should have also said that I'm a, I'm a director and shareholder of the Stand Comedy Clubs. And, you know, the, the numbers of people watching, Jennifer, you're absolutely right. They are, you know, it's exponentially larger than the number of people we get through the doors. Um, as I said, 70,000 on a Saturday. Um, but from our point of view, the, you know, we need the beer sales as well. We need the people actually in, in the clubs afterwards. Uh, to sell them a pint so that they can enjoy that right, along with their, their, their comedians. So it is vital that we still keep in contact with these people, but get them through the doors uh, once the crisis is over. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the, just to give uh, those who are watching um, online just now, you've got an opportunity through the Q&A facility to start posting questions to the panel. Uh, we're halfway through now, so uh, if you want to start posting your questions uh, online, and we'll start fielding them over the next couple of presenters, if that's okay also. Uh, next up is Leslie Bryden from Clark Communications. She's going to be focusing on uh, the external communications part, indeed how you manage the media approach and the landscape into the future coming forward. Uh, Leslie, over to you. Thanks, Graham. Let me just share my screen. I think that should be it now. So first of all, just uh, thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak this morning. I've been involved in this programme. Um, I'm going to call it a programme for the last uh, two weeks. It doesn't seem that long. But um, it's, been, uh, it's been fascinating to watch businesses coming together and helping each other. And that's what we're all here for this morning. So as, uh, as Graham said, if you've got any questions, please interact and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, I'm going to speak about the external comms piece. Um, now, obviously, all of these things are linked. Uh, Richard's talked to us about brand. Jennifer's talked to us about EBP. And it, I think what's coming through really strongly this morning is the way that we behave as businesses uh, has a has really sort of long lasting impact on our reputation, our ability to attract staff, our sales, and no more than at the moment uh, are, are people watching us as businesses and, uh, and seeing what we're doing and making future decisions about how they're going to interact with us. Let me just... There we go. Sorry, just getting the tech right. Um, so what I'm going to cover this morning is uh, some of the things that our clients have been asking us in terms of you know, whether to communicate, do we just, do we stay quiet at the moment or should we be out there talking? And if so, what should we be saying? What sort of content should we be looking at at the moment? Um, I've also spoken to a number of journalists and asked them what they want to hear about at the moment. So, um, so hopefully some of that information will be useful to you and your businesses. And then obviously some of the banana skins and some of those have been mentioned already, but some of the companies maybe that haven't quite been getting it right and, uh, and, and some that have and what we can take from that and what lessons we can take forward. And then I look at the future. A lot of companies are now starting to look at their exit strategy and it's something that certainly in this so short period of time, the, um, the narrative is changing so quickly. And, and this week, I think more so it's, uh, it's companies beginning to talk about how they exit this and how they're, gonna, um, how they're gonna move forward and how we behave now and how we interact with our audiences at the moment is really gonna set the scene for how, that's, uh, how successful that's going to be. So in terms of whether to communicate or not, I would say, yes, obviously, it's absolutely vital at the moment, both internally, as Jennifer was talking about, but externally as well. Um, speaking to staff and stakeholders, uh, obviously being 
clear and very careful in your communications with these audiences, but they should continue. Um, the media and, and a digital audience, which, uh, which obviously with the digital audience that uh, everybody's built up over the last few years, that's a huge audience to be communicating with. So again, very clear, but also very calm and, uh, and considered as a brand. And again, reflecting what some of the other speakers have talked about, that being accurate, being honest, being authentic, all of that adds up to trust. And that is what you want to come out of a crisis with. The purpose of communication at the moment is different to um, what it might have been two months ago. Two months ago, it might have purely been down to sales and increasing volume of sales. But now it's about maintaining that profile within a market where everything is very different and making sure that, uh, that you exit whatever situation we're in at the moment with um, a profile that you can build on and you don't need to tell your story from the beginning again. But also you might be articulating changes in your business. A lot of businesses are offering very different services at the moment, so they need to communicate them. And a lot of that is just about survival. Um, changing your offering, whether that's to help people or to maintain your service or some sort of service delivery as we go through these very strange times. There are, all, there are also businesses out there who are lobbying for change. They need help from the government. So they're communicating very strongly and quite often in a group with their competitors, which I'll talk a little bit more about further, um, further along. Keeping customers informed, um, clearly, if you're, a, a, if you're a consumer facing business, then keeping your customers informed as to how they can still use you as a business and what, uh, what you can offer them is extremely important. But also in reflecting back on what Jennifer was talking about there, that maintaining staff confidence and morale is, you know, it's very difficult when everybody's working from home and uh, maintaining your profile can really help with that. And it gives your teams a big boost as well to see their business out there or the business that they belong to out there behaving well and helping. So in terms of what should that content that you communicate be, what you do and say is really, really critical right now. The perception that you build now of your business is the one that could last for an awful long time. And there will be some businesses really regretting some of the things that they've said because the perception of them is going to last for a long time. Look at everything that you're putting together as content or that you're seeing through a really, really wide lens. Um, because it's really different and exciting for you as a business, it doesn't mean it necessarily is to others. So, you know, really take a critical look at, uh, at some of the messages. And I know Bruce is going to talk, talk, talk to us about messages after this, um, which I'm really looking forward to because that is absolutely key at the moment. Not all content is appropriate. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of journalists in prep for today and ask them what they think and you know a hundred percent of them came back and said we're seeing content that is boasting um that is too sort of me 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 and that's really really not what they want to see at the moment um, and they are creating their own perceptions of companies and how they're behaving at the moment going forward so, I mean, the, the sort of stress test for it, I would say if it feels wrong or if it feels a little bit off, it probably is. Um, you know, are your actions relevant? Are they useful at the moment in terms of society? Um, what is your business doing to help and what can it do to help? That innovating for the common good piece is, um, is really, really strong at the moment. And you'll note a lot of the companies that have been talked about so far are not um, you know, pushing that message at people at the moment. They're just doing what they can do to help. And off the back of that, their profile is, um, you know, is, is doing very well on it. Does your content demonstrate that you really appreciate the impact that this crisis is having? Um, yes, okay, we're in a business bubble and the, the impact on our businesses has been, um, has been very quick and, uh, and, and quite severe in some cases. 
but I think sometimes we forget that uh, that there's an awful lot more going on out there, and this is a this is a human crisis, uh, not just a business crisis, and therefore we all have to look at things a little bit differently. And what services do you offer that are absolutely needed right now, and how can you open that up to um, the the common good? There's a, there's a there's a lot of stories out there at the moment about companies diverting what they do into the common good and uh, and those that do that will um, will succeed in the future. And lastly there, put competition aside. Uh, it sometimes goes against the grain for businesses to work with their competitors. Um, it may be that, uh, that you could form a much stronger voice if you're working with your competitors. For example, if you're trying to lobby government for help for your sector, and we've seen that in an area uh, where, where one of our biggest clients is, is in the aviation sector, where uh, companies who normally um, you know, battle against each other on a daily basis have very much come together and formed a common voice and put aside that competition. I've seen a lot of that happen over the last couple of weeks. And again, the companies that are doing these things are being noted and, uh, and business journalists are playing that back to me in terms of, you know, we've, we've noticed that people are collaborating, they're innovating, they're breaking down those barriers and, uh, and, and, and they're making decisions about these companies at the moment. So just in summary on content is find your value, move very, very quickly. We don't have time to hang around at the moment, but be measured and calm and careful and clear. So just I mentioned that I'd been speaking to some journalists and, uh, and I thought it would be useful just to give you some of those insights from the, from the media that I have spoken to. Firstly, it's, uh, it's important to remember that uh, journalists and, uh, and, and media in general are in their businesses as well and they're in the same situation as a lot of us and that they're having to cut costs. In fact, as a sector, they were cutting costs um, anyway. So this has only put that into sharper focus. Um, so they're down on staff. Uh, because they're down on staff, there are some journalists who would normally do other things, like sports journalists, for example, who, um, who, who don't necessarily have anything to cover at the moment, who've been pulled onto different desks. Um, so you may find as a business that a journalist that you're dealing with is somebody who you're not familiar with and who's not familiar with you or necessarily the business sector. So that's certainly something to look out for. Um, I would say the criteria for a good business story has possibly relaxed a little bit and uh, some of the journalists that I've spoken to have said yes, you know, the stories that they normally wouldn't look at are maybe getting a bit of a second look at the moment. And a lot of that is because they're getting a lot of the same. Um, and a lot of the same is this is what we're doing for charity, this is what we're doing to help the NHS, um, aren't we fantastic? And, uh, and they're looking for something different to that. Um, their deadlines at the moment are tighter, much stricter. Uh, one of the journalists, one of the, it was a, a business editor said to me, if, if something is not with me by noon, then you can forget it. So whereas normally we would work to a mid to late afternoon kind of deadline, uh, depending on how big the story might be, you need to be looking at getting things to media much earlier in the day. And that means if you're working with a comms agency or you're working with your internal PR person and they're asking you as a business leader to, to approve something, then they really need it early in the day. Again, uh, it was a business editor that said, I'm, I'm getting bored with the, we're doing this for free and you know, aren't, aren't we great? They have, um, the market, I would say just in the last three weeks has matured very quickly and they're now looking for something that's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and you know, if you want to have an opinion on something, it should be on something that, uh, that, that you, know, you are an expert in. Um, interestingly, I, you know, this any signs of a business not doing the right thing. Um, I, it's, it's, it has been a strange couple of weeks because companies are normally very nervous about announcing things like um, that they have had to let staff go or that they're suffering financially 
or well as we have now that are furloughing staff and uh, we would normally be putting in place you know fairly uh, hefty comms programs for companies that have to announce things like that but at the moment it's a uh, you know that's not being picked up at all um but companies that don't do the right thing you know where banks may be not providing access to cash quickly enough um i heard of one company last week who just out of the blue decided to come up with a new family bereavement policy that they um that they circulated to all their staff or just doing some of that internal comms piece or some of the external comms piece but just getting it wrong and not doing that um does it feel right and if not don't do it um can end up in all sorts of trouble and the other thing that uh, journalists were saying at the moment are you know just about all stories out there do have a coronavirus lens on them at the moment and we should look at things through that lens but they still want the non-virus stories so your appointments uh fundraising mergers and acquisitions activity any sign really that things are still operating as normal the media are still really interested in so don't be afraid still to do those stories but just make sure to keep the tone of them appropriate and on to the banana skins i and I, you know i think they're, they're fairly obvious to people where leaders saying one thing doing another putting profit over people profiteering and um, you know these things are being noted now and you know the card is being marked of the businesses that are doing these things but again just being over dramatic over exaggerating your your worth in this situation um your role in the solution um and on the flip side of that completely hiding under the desk and not communicating at all is not going to do companies any good either and I, you know i listed there and, I, and some of them are are companies that have already been mentioned but the winners very much the supermarkets at the moment dyson ineos i have uh, have done some good things in the distilleries uh, there was a lot of stories a couple of weeks ago about distilleries i uh, you know not making gin anymore but um but making the hand sanitizer instead that is a good thing but some of them are now starting to be criticized but over branding that sanitizer that they're putting out to the nhs or they're putting out into the market and trying to use it as a branding opportunity so again there's a very very fine line between doing something that's good because you should and doing something that's good because you might be able to get brand points out of it as well i'm not going to um focus on the the, the sort of losers at the moment because they've been covered already or everybody is going to know their stories but um you know it suffice to say that what they have done both uh, in terms of communicating with their staff or um or externally has a uh, has, has well and truly bitten them in the backside and it's not something that's going to be forgotten very quickly so in terms of what the future might look like, you know, we talked at the beginning about, uh, about exit and about a lot of companies now looking at their exit, the reputations that companies form in these few weeks, whether they've spent two years, three years, really building their brand and building their reputation, how they act now while the lens is on now, while the lens is on businesses and how they behave will last for a, for a long time. People will be asking the questions, what did you do? How did you help? And as I said, the actions that some a lot of businesses have been forced to take now aren't going to make the headlines as they normally are. However, that unwillingness to reverse them or make good on promises that are made now, that's when these things will come into the spotlight. So if you're making promises now, they will be noted somewhere and somebody will come back to you on those. So just make sure that, uh, that you're not over promising at the moment. For that reason, you know, communications needs to be included in your exit strategy. And then the media themselves are also looking at, uh, at, at, at what the last few weeks has done for them. Um, and there's a little bit of an irony here that, you know, the um, advertising revenue has gone through the floor. Um, because of that, there is bound to be some consolidation in the, in the media market going forward. 
but the irony is here in that the surge in reader demand is absolutely massive. Um, you'll, you'll find it yourselves just personally, how much media that you're consuming and as well as everybody else at the moment. If they can hang on to that, then the advertising and the sponsorship side will come back and it'll turn around, but it will look very, very different. Uh, we've all got used to communicating like this. And uh, I think we're going to see an awful lot more of that far less traditional approach. Um, the, the switch from print media to online media has been happening for a long time, but it's moved light years in about three weeks. And, you know, that's not going to go back to whatever normal is. Um, there's, there's definitely going to be a new way forward with the media. Um, more paywalls for quality journalism. A few have dipped their toe in there, but I think there'll be an awful lot more of that. And uh, as, as one business editor, I think it was the Evening Standard said last week, the business leaders that are good on video and can be charismatic on, on a, in a situation like this are the ones that are going to rise to the top profile-wise in the future because there's going to be much more of that in the business media. So just a few things to think about going forward. Um, and again, thank you very much for having me today. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, Graham has had to duck out, folks. Uh, so I just want to say a couple of words before we move on to Bruce Hunter uh, for the final presentation. But if you have any questions for Leslie or Jennifer or indeed Richard as well, you can keep them coming in. I know we thought we might finish around 11, but we might go on a wee bit longer. And just what you were saying, Leslie, about content, um, and especially journalism, first of all, I want to direct anybody to Andrew Cotter on Twitter. You've maybe seen his dog commentary, just absolutely brilliant. And um, I have a, a Wednesday night pint uh, with some guys on Zoom um, from the, the world of sport. And Andrew's been seen more on Twitter with these commentaries than he has in any golf presentation he's ever done, uh, which is really, really funny. Uh, also, Marcus Brigstock and his wife, Rachel Paris, are doing uh, lip syncing. That's a, 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 and again, it's something that they're doing really just to keep their profiles up. There's no, you know, there's no monetary value in this, but it just shows the extent of their talent and it's worth maybe tuning in to see that as well. And my pal, Rob Rice, bizarrely, He's got six chickens and he does a five o'clock chicken race. <laughs> I just think it's wonderful uh, that they're finding those different things to do. And as far as content, uh, as Leslie was saying, you know, whether it's appropriate or not at this time, in comedy, I can't tell you the number of people that have said to me, this must be a, a great time for material. It's not. You know, we're human beings first and foremost. This is a crisis. It's an emergency. I dare say humour will come along at a later date. Last, um, in February there, I was involved in a serious car crash and a whole lot of people said, oh, that must be, you know, you must have got a lot of material out of that. No, it, it's, it's something that comes a wee bit further down the line. The only line I've got about that is that um, I was kept in A&E for, for four hours only, uh, but they kept my underwear in overnight for observation. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> Without going down that route too much, I'm going to pass over to Jude to introduce Bruce Hunter. Or you maybe can, way. You can, uh, or do you uh, want me to introduce him? You can introduce him, <laughs> okay. Here's Bruce Hunter. <laughs> so, morning all, thanks very much for uh, the invitation. So, um, good to talk. So, I guess the conversation so far, a lot of it's been about the brand, the external, the internal comms. We face into that in a world which now has an increased amount of digital, you know, interaction. So even more so now that part of the world has changed. You know, our roots are very much digital. And when we think about a little bit of context, um, I, I wanted to look just, you know, inside the home and what's happening because that's where all these messages are being consumed. So obviously our homes these days are our office. It's where our kids are getting schooled, sometimes with the doctor's surgery. Quite often, if it's like our house, we're uh, kind of constantly tracking how we can get a home delivery and spending, you know, a few hours tracking that for something that can arrive in three weeks. Calling mum or texting your friend about when you get that elusive bag of pasta. You know, those are the things that are happening in the house. And occasionally, as Fred alluded to, you jump on Zoom 
probably more so for uh, a little bit social interaction, lip, lip sync or a virtual quiz or something like that. And occasionally we also we, we also jump on a, a call, um, you know, in the house as well for um, wearing our pajamas, I think some of us have done that. So it's a very different environment, both digitally and what, what we're doing in the house where we're consuming all these messages. It's completely different over a period of a few weeks. So um, the channels that we've all alluded to earlier in these uh, presentations about um, you know, how we get those right are changing dramatically almost daily, if not weekly, um, but also in the way people feel about them is different as well. So the way that we get the right empathy and tone you know, has to be uh, has to be important as well. So, how do you do that at speed and get it right? So, maybe just briefly to introduce ourselves. So, you know, uh, I look after the European operations for um, a software as a service company called User Testing, and what that does is provide a platform to test all that messaging. So, find a way to ensure that you're getting it right and get rapid feedback at scale. And I'll come on to talk a little bit about what that means. So the first thing that you can you, you want to do is you basically want to pose a question about the content, the brand content, the comms, whatever it might be. And we can do that through pre-prepared, professionally written templates. Um, and we can also enable live conversation with your audience. So that way you've got a question to pose that you want to get feedback and you want to get insights on. The next thing you want to be able to do is point that towards your demographics. So you want to get the feedback from the people that you're intending it for. So you can do that through uh, our, our panel. So we've got 1.5 million people that you know, are, are testers that you can access. You can do that through pointing it directly towards um, your own customers, if that's, that's what you've got access to, or you indeed your own employees. So you can, you can do it that way. The third thing that you get is you get video feedback. So that's really important because the videos give you the, the tone, the expression, the feeling that comes back with it. So that allows you to get a real insight into how people feel and think about it. And those videos are then transcribed into messages, you know, that you can have in written form as well. That enables you to do specific analytics and it also allows you to produce almost, uh, if you think of the football, you know, where you get the full match and the highlights, it produces highlight reels. So the most telling parts of the feedback that you got, you're allowed to put in a highlight reel and then you can in turn share that across your company, your board, your management team, your customers, whatever that might be. So really what we do is provide a platform to take all the things that we've spoken about earlier and then you know, point a question at them, direct it towards an audience and gather a bunch of feedback. And that way we really ensure that we've got it right. We've got the empathy, we've got the tone, you know, we've got the context that we wanted because it's all pointing towards those, those houses that we're all in with all those things that are going on, different dynamics in a completely different world with the pandemic. So let me talk about how we specifically target that message towards what the, the talk track is today around, you know, trying to do that in the COVID-19 period. So the templates that we've got cover a range of things. They cover verticals, they cover different uh, um, creative messaging that you might want to look at. But these ones along the bottom in my clumsily done green box, um, so are COVID messages. So the first one is a, re a set of pre-written uh, questions and a template that start to understand how people's behavior has changed. So that could be behavior towards specifically your business. So as an example, the behavior that people have now got towards grocery shopping. So whether it's queuing around the block six feet apart or the online shopping, it's changed. The second one in the middle here that I'm highlighting is about um, you know, a, pre, a template that tests um, your response to the virus. So how it is that people have perceived that you have reacted in this current situation. And then the third one that I'm going to focus on with a couple of examples is the messaging. So Richard alluded to some of the, 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 the really positive messaging, brand messaging that's been, been uh, used by a few different companies. So the messaging is really where you would grab something like one of your adverts or you grab a piece of your content and you would test how effective that messaging has been. And what really that, those set of questions do is they gather things that are along here on the right, impression of the messaging, how it makes them feel, and what's resonated and so on. So it's, it's basically a pre-built template to get you that feedback. 
So if I take an if I take a, an example now, bear with me. So Skyscanner is one of our customers, and I'm sure most of you will recognize Skyscanner as the brand. Travel business, clearly, even if they wanted to, not much to sell, nobody's traveling. So Skyscanner have produced a campaign which includes a one minute video, which really tries to give people hope that at the end of this pandemic, then they'll be able to go to the places they want to go and they'll be able to visit the people they want to see. So they've, they've done that and then they've provided a platform on social media for people to share where those places might be. So really what they're trying to do is connect with their audience and ensure that at the end of this, then they can provide them the, the, the way that they want to go and see people and travel to places they want to go. So what, what I did here, and I'm, bear in mind I'm not a technical person, I, I set this test up in three minutes. So basically I selected the messaging template I then selected my audience, which you can see here at the top. Um, so I went for UK based folks, age 30 to 50. Um, they had children 12 or under, household income bracket between 35 and 50,000 pounds. And I selected that template, clicked that audience. We could do a few other things and uh, launched it. And an hour and 20 minutes later, all that feedback came back. So we had those videos, we had all those messages you know, from people responding to those questions that represented that particular demographic. And to give you some examples, just in brief form, I won't do the videos of what, what came back. Along the top, you see the templated uh, grouped answers. So how to make them feel, what resonates, um, the meaning of the content, motivation, so on. And the red is from a 41 year old female with two children, a boy age 12 and a girl age three. And that's verbatim what she said. So how did it make how did it make um, how did it make her feel? Happy because it was such a sad time. Emotional because the imagery was beautiful. Connected because it was about seeing the people you love and doing the things you love. Really empathetic connection with this particular um, panelist. Below is the in the green is from a, an, another respondent, which was a thirty year old male one child, other information you can gather, uses Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, so interested in what social channels they're using. And this really taught, said what resonated with them. So again, you can read that message about talking about what feedback that particular individual gave. And this feedback that came back in one hour and 20 minutes represented four females and a male, the females between the ages of 30 and 41, and the male was 30. So really powerful to see if you're getting your message right. And it looks like Skyscanner, having tested that message, it's really powerful. To give a couple of other examples here now, first of all, talking about adapting messaging. So two of our other customers, Deliveroo and Just Eat, they fundamentally focus their messaging on contactless delivery. So where the takeaway gets dropped on your doorstep, all the payment for the, deliver the, the takeaway is made electronically and where the information that's passed out really talks to how food is not a way that you can get contaminated or you infected, you know, and, you know, the sources of that information. So really trying to, you know, make people feel comfortable about how they can still buy that service. So that was researching what was important to people and how that could be delivered. The message in the middle is from some other research that really is just one comment of many that talks about the over-communication in the current environment and really this is saying that, you know, from one company that you may have talked to once, suddenly I'm getting, hi mate, how you doing? This kind of friendly message. And it finds, find it, people are finding it cliche. They're getting it over communicated with. They find it salesy and people are trying to take advantage of the situation. On the message on the bottom in, in yellow, this was a different response to that. How did you, how did you find the messaging during COVID-19? And somebody found a really positive message was Morrison's that had focused on providing, you know, a box that was meeting dietary requirements. And they felt that was a really positive way to put their business forward because they were helping people. So really wide range of different, different responses, different situations to messaging. In terms of who's testing right now, just to give you an idea of our landscape, our world, we've got about 1500 customers globally. Um, they're across a whole wide range of sectors. So you can see there, you know, uh, financial services, high tech, travel. 
And really the biggest interest over the last sort of week or 10 days has been the, the change in behavior. So if we look at those templates, the change in behavior has been really, really interesting to companies that are doing it. And the surge in terms of testing has gone up about 40% during the last five to six weeks as people you know, are very active in testing COVID-19 or the specific pandemic situation messaging. Um, in terms of some of the other use cases, just briefly, um, e-commerce massively being tested because clearly that's the route to market for many companies, launching new services, um, schools, lots of different use cases that are getting tested. Again, trying to get that feedback on the messages that uh, they're delivering. And just by way of trying to help in this situation, we have our, our product in this area is called Market, in, Market Insight. Um, you can go on to this link, you can drop in a few details and we're handing out free tests. So you can basically use this to test your messaging and see if that's been affected during this period. So we've, we've le left a bunch of those available for people to use. So just in the interest of trying to catch up time, I ran a little over there, but hopefully that's useful in terms of seeing how you can actually test your messaging, whether it's internal, external, brand, um, and try and get it right. Because as we come out of this, I think what all the previous speakers have said is going to be really important how people feel about your business. So that was it. Thanks very much. Any questions? Happy to take those. Thank you very much, Bruce. And thanks to Richard, Jennifer and Leslie as well. Um, I found all of the presentations interesting, informative, and even for me, uh, very helpful. Um, not just for just now, but for when things get back to whatever is going to be the norm or the new normal, as people are saying. Um, Jude, you've got the, the tech side of things under control there. I wonder maybe if there are any questions for any of the uh, people that made their presentations today before we all sign off. Yeah, there's um, one um, here. It says, um, all the contributions are excellent, but the question that uh, Chris Middleton has asked is, supermarkets have been held up as brands that have performed well in a crisis. Is there an argument to say it's easier for them to do so? Um, God, I've lost now because the screen's after chain. Is it easier to do so given the current crisis? They're in demand, taking on staff, handing out dividends, all good news stories, and the true test of great comms will come through those brands facing a more negative outlook. Anybody want to take that, Richard? Or? Yeah, sure. Happy to take it. I mean, the example I used was, was Sainsbury's and, and purely, I mean, I, I can't, can't comment about the other ones because I haven't, I haven't looked into them as closely as I did it. Uh, for Sainsbury's, yes. I mean, obviously they, they provide uh, food and, and if you look at where we are at the moment and without sounding, trying to sound too intelligent, Maslow's hierarchy, you know, food and, and water and shelter are basic needs and, and so supermarkets are able to provide us with, with two of these three things. What I will say about Sainsbury's is the fact that, that they, they are obliged as a listed stock to report quarterly. Therefore, all their actions that they take are around delivering shareholder value and therefore profits. And what they have shown throughout this, uh, this pandemic has been, well in the UK terms, has, has, has been a desire to think more longer term. And um, they could quite easily have um, not opened uh, to vulnerable groups earlier. They could quite easily have just allowed people to panic buy and, and, and take whatever they could at the time um, if they were uh, wanting to, to chase those long-term profits. Um, but, but it still stands that I think their, their, their choice to pursue an altruistic purpose will benefit them in the long term and therefore create shareholder value. But, you know, over the next, um, the next uh, you know, year or so. And I think the staff on the ground have to be commended as well because you know, people are asking for PPE, Absolutely. frontline positions and stuff like that as well. And you walk into the stores and my heart goes out to those people going, am I going to catch something? And... I have witnessed people being really rude to them and stuff like that as well. And you're like, why? You know, they're here, they're trying to keep us going and in supposedly the necessities and people nipping in and getting one can of beer and stuff. Well, and they're not the police, they can't police it and they've got a really tough job to do. Um, so, yeah, uh, I did, there's, most of the questions have been answered. Um, I'm going to hand over to Paul. First of all, thank everybody um, for coming on today. Um, all the panelists, you've been amazing. For Fred, we didn't know if it would work out. We said, let's take a chance and bring some humour in, but I think it has. You kept me entertained anyhow. <laughs> thank you, guys. I hope, I hope it did. Um, Absolutely. 
uh, yeah, and uh, thank you all for yeah, putting up with our madness at times and going, will this work? But I think it has, and it's great to see the community all pulling together, business and comedians. So hand it over to Paul. Paul, you're on mute. Thanks, Jude. Um, yeah, fantastic webinar this morning. Thanks for all the contributions and uh, Fred for adding some humour to it and Graham for commandeering us through the process this morning. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, emphasise one or two things from each of the speakers uh, who covered a range of topics. First of all, Richard, um, uh, resilience and stoicism uh, is going to get us through this at this time, this crisis. Doing the right thing, acts of kindness, um, um, have self-discipline, have courage, and, and you know successful brands will be the ones we look back on at this time that have performed against that. Jennifer, the importance of vision and values for uh, both internal and external communications alignment really, really important. Important, and uh, you know being authentic um, through that process I think is is critical. Um, Leslie, you know. Um, how we behave at this time uh, will have a long lasting impact on how people perceive our businesses. Um, we got, you gave some great practical guidance, um, uh, communicating with purpose, uh, creating trust, but above all being sensitive to how other people are going to be feeling about their own positions at this time and making sure communication is taking that into account. And Bruce, uh, fantastic use of technology um, uh, to test the messaging at speed and at scale. Uh, I think that's going to be critically important in terms of helping us understand how we exit this process and how normal business resumes, which it will at some point. I think pand this pandemic will change certain behaviour forever, I think. Uh, so we'll be able to measure that uh, and then change our messaging accordingly, I think is really important. So finally, I'd like to thank um, everybody for coming on this webinar this morning. I hope you took a lot away from it. Um, I know we've got more webinars coming up, uh, which you'll be able to track on the SBRC website. Jude. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, and see you all soon. Thank you.